working at a school they really enjoy it, they're not going to move to the middle of Illinois to teach. So it's a great opportunity for first year teachers to get that job, maybe even in a position that you want to be teaching in, that maybe the school that was your dream school isn't going to be offering you. So right off the bat, early postings. Me, I was really nervous about the whole process, even though I made it look like I wasn't. Deep down, I really was. And so early postings, I could start applying in January. My school already has four postings up there since the beginning of the year. If there's anyone Spanish, there is a job opening at my school for high school that they've been looking for and no one's applied yet. So they're already out there. The other thing is they usually post for a specific job. So if you're going to a big school here in the Quad Cities, they're going to say, I need a math teacher. They're not going to tell you what you're teaching. You probably won't find out until a couple weeks before school. I knew sending in my application, I would be teaching upper level math, including calculus, if I had gotten the job. So right off the bat, I knew what I'd be applying for, and it was awesome. Made you feel a little more confident about what you're applying for, especially when they offered you the interview, and you're like, what, this was my dream job? And you're offering it an interview, you want to talk to me. So that was great. And lastly, you might have to be familiar with the US Postal Service again. You might have to buy some stamps. Some of the more rural schools, they want you to send mail in your application and your cover letter. Some will do uh, an email. We always want to follow that up with a paper copy as well. So you might have to get a little familiar. So the interview process, the first one, I don't know if it was a special case with my school, but they were a little more flexible than some of the other jobs. I studied abroad in Jamaica last spring break, and they wanted me to come in while I was going to be in Jamaica for an interview. And I was like, hey, this isn't going to work, guys. I'm really interested. And they were able, actually, to push back my interview. So that was awesome, because they even offered me the job. So they were really interested in me being an Augie student. They really were looking at what we do here. Um, Going into the interview, since you know it's a specific position posted, I knew they were going to ask me about why I wanted to be teaching calculus, what I would do in the classroom to help prepare those students for college, compared to if I was going in for an interview for Algebra 1. They won't be asking me, oh, how are you going to get the transition from high school to college? And lastly, they, able, they right off the bat handed me, this is going to be your schedule if I offer you the job. I knew exactly what I was going to be teaching from the minute I walked out of that interview. So if they did offer me the job, I could really contemplate, did I see myself working that schedule, working with the kids, teaching the classes that I'd be teaching, which was a great opportunity. So some things to consider if you land the interview and they offer you the job, they call you and they're like, hey, we want to extend you the position. So this stems a lot from my experiences at the school, and there's really five main areas. So the school itself. Could you see yourself in the building and the classroom they're offering you? And I'll go a little more in depth. Administration, what is administration support are you going to have? Who are you going to interact with? Did you meet them in the interview? Or did you not meet the principal in the interview and it was some other person interviewing you? The staff you're going to be working with, ask maybe in your interview. I got to meet with the math department in my interview, which is only two other teachers. But I got to meet some of the staff. Can I see myself there? Um, students. Some of the kids on the hall, when you're doing the tour, maybe some of the students will interact with you or the principal will introduce you. So you can see, are you going to work with the students well? And then curriculum. What standards? Do they have a curriculum they're going to hand out to you and say, here, this is what you need to teach, or are you going to be developing it? So I kind of went with benefits and challenges that I found with each of these topics. So for a small school, I have a really small building. I only have 280 kids in the building. Our biggest class, I think, is 75. I think it's our sophomore class right now. So the small building, it has 20 classrooms. I can easily navigate the building. Not very hard. It took five minutes to walk around the building during my interview. I also have really small class sizes. So average for my school off of the Illinois report card are 15 students. My smallest class is nine, and my biggest class is 23. So right there, I'm not dealing with the 30 students that I might be working if I'm working at a Chicago um, suburban school, which is great. I get to know my kids a little more. And so one of my challenges for this one is busing. I never realized this until I went to a rural school. A lot of the students, the only way to get to school is they ride the bus. 
When I was growing up, I walked to school every day. I didn't have to run on the bus schedule. And they offer, also don't offer activity buses. So the students, if their bus leaves at 3.05 and the school lays out at 3, they can't stay there and talk to you for five minutes about their math homework. If their bus drives five minutes before class, they can't take the quiz in the early morning. So it's kind of a change, because I was used to just getting to school early, you can do all your stuff, ask all your questions, but they're really run on their bus schedule. Their life is run by buses and belts. Administration. So some of the benefits I found is super duper small administration. I have a principal, a vice principal, and a superintendent. That's all my administration. And my principal's been out for the whole first half of the year having heart surgery. So I only had two people that I really had in my administration that were my bosses. So that's cool. I get to know him personally. The superintendent invites everyone over to his house all the time for drinks and stuff. You get to really know them personally and know that they care about what you're teaching. It also means they're in your classroom a lot. So they'll walk in randomly. The students won't realize it. You'll realize it because you're walking around and see the door. Oh, the principal's in here today. The vice principal's in here another day. So that's cool. They give you great feedback. And you really get to know who they are. There's also a clear chain of command if anything happens. So if there's a major issue, well, who do I go to first? Well, you only have three people to pick from. And it's clearly there's a scale on who you should go to first. So some challenges that I found, and I don't know if it's just my school, but there's been a huge lack of information. There are two new teachers in our building this year, and so sometimes they just forget to tell us things. What's the date of map testing? Well, everyone else knew. How did I get the memo? Or wait, how am I supposed to log a behavior report? Because there was no first year teacher orientation. So you kind of have to learn on the job and learn to ask questions. Find that teacher who's there for you. I do have a mentor, um, but we don't have any planning times together, so he's not necessarily a great resource. Um, but one of the, the other math teacher in our department, I ask him all the questions or go down the hall to the second year teacher who went through it last year so she knows exactly what I'm going through. So that's one of my challenges. Staff. Well, if you only have 20 classrooms, you only have about 20 staff members. So that means you're really close you either get to know them really well or hate them really fast. Um, which I haven't really had any that I've hated yet. But there's some that just rub me the wrong way. But you put on a smile, you greet them. There's only 20 of them, so if you hate one, well, guess what? The whole school's going to hate you <laughs> if you hate that one. Um, we also know who to go to for help. So you find out right away who's helpful to you. And I found this great for behavior management. The junior class that I'm teaching right now is just a disaster, and every single teacher in the building knows it. And so going to other teachers saying, hey, who's the junior English teacher? Let's go see how he's, they're dealing with the kid is helpful so that you're not feeling alone, and you don't have to go track down the schedule. Well, what class is he in? It's clear, distinct. Who do I need to go to? It's not hard. Um, relationships with other staff members, you get to really build them, especially on my last point, sponsor. Um, so usually a small school, if you only have 25 staff members and there's however many sports and clubs, someone has to do it and you're going to get one first year, right off the bat. So I'm junior class sponsor, there's two of us, we're going to be planning prom, but that means I have to go to basketball games because that's how we fundraise for prom. And I have to plan meetings and all this other stuff on top of the teaching and it's great to learn the students and I've loved it but it's also a challenge at the same time. You kind of forget that responsibility. I was planning on driving out yesterday, realized I had a basketball game ahead to be at. So it is a challenge just trying to manage your time between all of it. But it's the first year teaching so it's always a problem anyway. Students. At a small school, I find the students so far have been the best part of all of it, and I hope every single school you go to, that is the best part of it. Um, so one benefit, I came from a high school that was 2,500 students. There were people across, walking across the stage I didn't even know went to my high school. Kind of like Augie, where it's small, or it's big, but you know everyone at Augie. I didn't know everyone in my high school. So I get to know the majority of the students. So if there's only 280 people you need to learn, that's a nice number. Everyone who walks by my door, they know me, I know them. Even if we're not in class together, we get to meet them all. 
Um, I'm going to have students from multiple years. This is really cool. So I teach Algebra 2 equivalent. It's called Math 3. I'm the only pre-calc trig teacher and I'm the only calculus teacher. So everyone I teach in Math 3, if they're destined for the other classes, I'm going to have them for a potential of three years. That means it's a three long year long relationship with that student so that I can really get to know them and actually have an impact on their life, which I think is awesome so far. So you also get to see where students are involved and see that you're involved. They love that I am junior class sponsor. I show up to all the basketball games. They can next day in class and you can be like, hey, what do you think of my three point shot that I shot last night at the basketball game? Right there, instant connection with the students. They see that you're there. I went to the school play. I knew every single person on stage. I had all of them as students. And it was great. They were like, thanks so much for coming, Ms. McCurry. It was great to see you here and involved in the community. So they really love that part. And then the students are also really involved in the community of their school because there's only 280 to do everything. So some challenges by students, small school, students being over involved. How many clubs are you in? 10. Sounds like an Aussie student. Um, but happening at the high school level as well. So one of my main challenges for behavior management is all the students know each other. They've been in the same school with all the same kids since kindergarten. So either they love each other too much that they just talk the whole time, or they hate each other, which has almost led to a fight in my classroom between a four foot 11 girl and a six foot five guy. <laughs> it's getting drastic in there. Cause they just, they're fed up with each other. They've been in school too long together. So you have to be careful when doing groups. Make sure you know which kids are the ones that aren't going to get along. Don't put them in the same group because it's not going to be productive. So a lot of times I let them pick because they'll pick kids that they get along with. Because I have a lot that don't like each other. And then lastly, for a small school, their goals in life are very different than what I grew up with. I had the expectation I was going on to college here at Augustana. A lot of us we made it to college. So you grew up with that. Your parents expected it or the community of your school expected it. But in a small school, at least at my small school, when I asked them the first day, write me a letter, tell me what you want to do in life, college was the least on the list was they were planning on going to college. A huge chunk going to military that might end up at college one day, but there were also those students that were saying, I'm going to take over my family's farm or my family's grocery store, whatever they do in town. They're planning on staying in the area. And so that's been one of my challenges is, yes, you need to do the math to applicable to college and Common Core is all pushing for that. A lot of that's leading to college, but how do you get to those students that they're planning on taking over the grocery store? They need to learn how to count change, not learn how to graph something. So it's getting that applicable, which I didn't realize how hard it was until I was standing up there trying to convince these students that they should care about my class. So that's been one of the biggest challenges with students. And lastly, curriculum. So one of the benefits I found so far is that the district has standards that they have, Common Core standards, but for my upper level classes they have standards they expect as well. And they gave me a curriculum map up front saying this is how our schools decided to do it, follow the curriculum map, you're all good and dandy. Which led me, well, I didn't have a lot of resources so I get to decide how I want to teach some of the material. I'm also helping develop our Math 3 curriculum. Um, with one of the other teachers because there's two of us teaching that class. So that's been some cool stuff with the curriculum at the small school, but that's also a lot with the changing times now in education. But one of the challenges that I found is I have to make all of my own materials. There's not another teacher I can say, hey, you make the worksheet, I'll make the PowerPoint. In the end, I'm teaching three of my classes without someone else teaching it. And I didn't realize how hard it was <laughs> until I had to do it all myself and spend time up till midnight every night trying to figure out what I'm doing in my classroom the next day. That's one of the biggest challenges with this small school. You don't have someone else you can rely on to make materials for you. You're the only one. Can I add something to that, Kelly? Yeah. With that, too, I teach at a really small school. Um, my school is a little bit bigger than Kelly's, but I teach in Arcola, Illinois, which is just about 30 minutes south of Champaign. One thing that I didn't really recognize until I went to that interview and was told what jobs that I was teaching is I teach four different classes. 
I have four different classes that I need to prepare for every day. Now, at first, that was super overwhelming because like, it's a decent amount of work to plan for one class for a whole week. But to plan for four different classes for an entire week, particularly when one of my classes is like a low level, and the students then in that class are separated into two class periods where one's the highest group and one's the lowest group, so it's almost five classes that I'm prepping for, is exhaustive. And so one of the things that you'll become really good at is time management if you do end up at a smaller school. One of the things though that I like really draw out of this is my day is entertaining. Like I don't have to teach algebra two six times all day. I have like different classes and my day stays really upbeat because of that. And I also don't get into that trap where I'm like, wait a second, did I say this already? Because I taught the same thing four times. <laughs> so that definitely like it keeps me on my feet and it's been really exciting. So there's benefits and drawbacks to being there. But yeah, I'm the sole teacher of all four classes that I teach. And we have, we have a PLC as well, and there are teachers there who teach, like, honestly, six different classes. Each one of their class periods is a different class. And so that's just one of the opportunities and one of the challenges of teaching at a smaller school. And I've also found that while I have that other teacher who teaches the same math three with me, he has 10 kids, I have 65. So his one class of 10 <laughs> is going to be taught way differently than my three classes of 20 or above students. So even that, our curriculum is varying, and yes, he can help me somewhat, but at the same time, what it's going to work for his student is very different from mine. But going off of Jessica's comment on days being entertaining, what's interesting about a small school is while there's not really tracking, some of the classes the students decide to take track themselves. So like my fourth hour math three class has all the sophomore high level kids in it because of something else they have to take. Where my seventh period class is really low and has my, it's my adventure power hour class to get <laughs> through it um, because it has different, way different students. The students who don't want to work, who are taking it, they're seniors, they're trying to just get the credit to pass, to graduate at the end. So just that, even though they say they're not tracking, a lot of the schools, since whatever you pick to take, really decides to track it. So in the end and conclusion, you shouldn't discount small schools, especially because they are a significant portion of the jobs out there. And for a first year teacher, you might end up in what you think is your dream job. I've always wanted to teach calculus and pre-calc and all those upper level math classes. And this is my opportunity that's given to me. Maybe not where I thought I would end up, because I didn't think I'd end up at a school with 280 kids. But at the same time, it's been a great opportunity so far. So any questions? Is this something that you see yourself doing for a long term or for a short term? I think it really depends. It's only been however many weeks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not even through a semester yet. Um, but really just seeing the benefits just from my high school experience, I feel way more connected to a lot of my students that when I go to apply for a different job if I do need to move, I'm not going to discount them, I really probably am going to look at it, and the hard thing is, is all schools are different, so until you end up there and find out what it's really like, it's hard, but so far I really like my experience, especially because instantaneously you're with all these kids, and there's only a certain number, so you can learn them all and really get to meet them all, where during student teaching, I was student taught at Pleasant Valley, I didn't know any of the kids walking down the hallway. They never really recognized me out of the classroom. I was the student teacher, but they showed up at my class and they left. There was no other really interaction. So I really like that, building those relationships. Any other questions? I'm gonna build on that last comment that Kelly said too. One of the big things, and I wanna know if you're noticing this too, but there's a really big sense of community in my school, not just among the students, but among the parents as well. Parents, since it's a small, like honestly my town has 3,000 people in it, the parents are really heavily involved in the school and they like to know what's going on there. We went one-to-one -one with iPads last year and the community and the parents in the community actually fundraised all of the money to get the iPads. So the parents were grant writing to get us iPads for the students. And that, like, that's one of the things that blew me away during my interview and one of the things that like really impressed me to go for the school. And then Kelly's teaching calculus, I'm teaching calculus too. If you're looking for a job in the suburbs that has those higher levels, a lot of the times you're going to be offered the lower level starting positions. And the small schools are a good opportunity to be able to jump in at a higher level and immediately like start that off right away. See, my situation is a little different. Our, my parent involvement isn't very great at all. 
actually. And it's it's a whole county school, so it encompasses. Are you consolidated? Town. Yeah, so it's okay. a yeah, so there district. is a difference between consolidated schools, and so our school has stayed separate. The only students who come to my school are students who are in the town. Consolidated schools are busing students from different communities, so there will be a different. So ours is all, it's a, it's a county district, and it's always been a county district. Um, so it's K-12. So it's also something to look, consider when looking at it is the superintendent and administration has to make decisions that are good for every student from preschool, since we have a preschool, up through senior year of high school. So these decisions being made are made for the whole district compared to a lot of the schools, like even in the suburbs and stuff, there's the high school district and then the elementary district. So it's very different because when we talk about things or we're looking for a new superintendent because he's retiring, well, we, they have to take into account everyone in the district. They can't just be looking for, oh, they taught high school, they know what high school works, they did administration here at the high school, now they'll be perfect. They have to find one that works for the whole entire district. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly.